Mora conducts physician-led support groups, helping people live healthier, happier lives, free from chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And on our podcast, Health and Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus, we bring to you nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests to empower and inspire you with their knowledge and stories of plant-based lifestyle so that you can be your healthiest self. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today I'm so excited because I'm bringing on one of my dear friends, Kim Campbell. How are you today? I'm good, Lori. I'm glad to be here. It's always fun to chat with you for a while. Oh, absolutely. It's such, uh, such a joy and an honor to be uh, able to sit and talk to you about yet another wonderful cookbook that you've put forth, which we're going to talk about. Um, and Again, just it's just I'm so delighted that you're here. So there's a lot of amazing resources, guys. So check in and please listen. Share this with any and all of your friends who are interested or you think would be interested in, you know, starting on a plant-based diet and really looking for great resources because Kim, they've got it all. They've got the food, they've got the books, they've got the some community support. So check this all out. Um, so let's start with this amazing book, uh, Plant Pure Comfort Food. Mm -hmm got my favorite words, plants and comfort, right? <laughs> so tell us, how did this come about? And let's start there. Okay. Um, so we called it Plant Pure Comfort Food, and I can talk a little more about that, about how we came up with the title. But early in the pandemic, it was probably a month or two after everybody became isolated, we started doing online cooking classes. So it was a it was a cook along. So I would send people the grocery lists and I would send them the recipes and they would cook with me. And the great thing was we had new recipes every week, but I had testers, built-in testers. And the same people came every single week. So I thought, oh, this is a good idea. Let's start, you know, really testing and ramping up these, these uh, recipes. So we did 50, I think we did 50 shows roughly. And at the end of the pandemic, some shows we did two or three recipes. At the end of the pandemic, I thought, I have a cookbook now. I thought I had one, but I knew I had one at the end of the pandemic, not the end of the pandemic, but at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So I contacted my publishing company that did the, the other two cookbooks, and they also did the China study. They were thrilled. So they said, we'll take it. Let's go. So we hired a photographer, which I would love to take um, credit for these, these pictures, but they're beautiful. Oh. Nicole and they did our photographs and she did a fantastic job um so it took about a year a year later we published it december 14th just this past december 14th it took that long because of you know supply chain issues and things like that um but that's that's kind of where it came from it'll probably be my last cookbook because i've got three now um we have plant pure nation plant pure kitchen and plant pure comfort so um that's that's it in a nutshell Oh, what about the ones around the world kind of recipes and well that's what yeah that's what's cool about this particular cookbook so when we were doing it Nelson and I weren't going out to eat we were we were at home and we were trying to recreate some of our favorite recipes from around the world things like falafels and muhammara and spanish paella and so i feel like that's what this book is i think we sort of went into other cultures we tried to find the recipes that were most comforting in those cultures and the things that we get at restaurants here mm. so that's where that comes from i think yeah. that's wonderful because one of the things that i hear from patients all the time is like well, you know, they may, maybe they come from an Indian or Asian background or Mexican and they're like, well, how does this fit into my culture versus this, you know, American, you know, standard Caucasian, standard American diet type culture. Um, so that's wonderful. And I will tell you guys, I have been fed by Kim on multiple occasions and it's delicious. And then you have testers built. I mean, geez, this is great. Um, and the pictures are beautiful. And if I seriously, I haven't had time for lunch yet because of meetings today, but I will tell you, I'm just dying. Check this out, guys. It's phenomenal. So mm, yeah. I'm, it's like <laughs> my stomach's going, I want to eat the page. Um, just phenomenal. Um, so you went ahead and you were developing. So how do you get an idea? So let's say you, you see something and you're like, you know, that sounds good. How can I make it plant-based? So like, how would you help someone? Maybe there's some grandma's recipe or something. How would you go about with that recipe development? Because I feel like that's a really important skill that a lot of people don't have. It is, it is. And I think knowing your substitutions is really key. And I, I feel like I've got a substitute. I've been doing this for so long that I 
feel like I've got a substitution for almost everything. So when I look at a recipe, um, I'll give you an example. One of the recipes in the cookbook was for lasagna stew. I found it in one of those magazines at the beach house we were staying at. And I looked at it and thought, oh, this has got to be in my kitchen. So I, I went down through every single ingredient and tried to substitute it. So like I used lentils for the beef and I used um, ricotta cheese. I used tofu for the ricotta cheese instead of the regular cheese. So just really knowing your substitutions, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Because I think finding recipes that are more traditional and then making those substitutions, they always come out better, I think. You can still Google vegan recipes. There's, a, there's some great ones out there, but um, I still like to watch Bobby Flay. I still like to watch that stuff. <laughs> I love that. So what are maybe your top five substitutions that you would see in a lot of different recipes that might be able to at least help people start thinking in that, mm -hmm. in that way? Right. So meat's the first thing that people like to substitute. So I would say using things like soy curls. Um, we love soy curls and you can get those through Butler Foods. You introduced um, me to soy curls and I can't say enough about soy curls, guys. So definitely take that one on. Amazon Butler curls. <laughs> they look like um, little pieces of chicken strip and you they're dry and you hydrate them, but they're only made with 100% soybeans. There's no like partial this or partial that. It's 100% soybeans. So I use those. I, I like to use lentils. Um, sometimes I use walnuts uh, and cauliflower. If I'm doing a taco, I might make like a walnut cauliflower taco meat. Um, jackfruit is wonderful. Some people love it. Some people hate it. But jackfruit is a great option for meat substitutes. Chickpeas. Um, I'm thinking of like a tuna fish, making a chickpea tuna fish, um, you know, really utilizing your beans. And then the next thing that I think people struggle with is dairy. That's a tough one. So, you know, we, there's so many plant-based milks out there. I, I think that that's an easy substitution. Um, we use soy milk. Some people like almond milk. And then I make my own yogurt. You can buy plant-based yogurts, but I, I buy probiotic tablets, put them in the yogurt, strain the yogurt, and you get something that tastes, well, just like, to me, it tastes just like regular yogurt. Um, so that's a great substitution using tofu as a meat replacer, but also as a cheese replacer, because when you grind it up and puree it, it's very creamy and rich. You can put it on top of pizza. Um, I'm going to try to think, help me out, Lori. Nutritional yeast flakes. Yep. How do you make the tofu taste like cheese and which type of tofu do you use? Right. So if I'm making ricotta cheese, I put it in a food processor, blend it up and I add I might add some nutritional yeast flakes, a little bit of lemon juice. The lemon juice gives it that sort of acid that you're looking for. Some people will actually put a probiotic into the tofu when they're blending it. And that actually gives it that, oh, I don't know how to explain it, but that sort of cheesy fermented flavor. Like the dirty sock sensation type thing. Dirty sock, yes, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> You can also make, um, you know, you can make Parmesan cheese by taking cashews and nutritional yeast flakes and some spices and blending it. Now you've got Parmesan cheese. Mm. Um, so then you have meat, you have dairy. Eggs is a tough one, but if you're just using eggs to bake with, or you're using it as a binder, use your chia seeds, use your flax meal. They're great. A banana is also another great substitute. You know, I have a whole book on substitutions and I wish I had it here with me, but it's an old book that I found at Barnes and Noble and it has all kinds of plant-based substitutions. Mm -hmm. And if you Google it, Google plant-based substitutions, people have, they write blogs on this stuff. It's really mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. And what are your go-to sauces? Like what are your easy sauces? Cause I know it seems like you can, you know, like when people food prep, the time is a big one is one of the problems. So it's like, you know, for food prep, I'm encouraging people to get your grain, get your bean, get your veggies, and maybe some different uh, type of uh, sauces that are easy to make. Mm -hmm. um, my go-to sauce is probably a cheese sauce. That's really, I mean, it's, it's really simple. It's per, basically, it's a cashew, it's a cashew water or cashew milk mixture with a little bit of onion powder, garlic powder, nutritional yeast flakes. Sometimes I put some lemon juice in it. 
And you can just put it in a mason jar and have it for if you want to make macaroni and cheese or you want to make like a cheesy breakfast casserole. So that's that's one of my go-tos. I have an enchilada sauce, which is in the cookbook. It's a mole sauce. And you've had that because I think mm -hmm. I've had that too. Mm -hmm. um, I have a teriyaki sauce, but not in this cookbook. There's a teriyaki sauce in the other cookbook I have. Um, I'm actually looking down here because there's so so many of them that I can't, I mean, there's a hollandaise sauce. Um, I have a hoisin dipping sauce. You know, find the sauces that you really like. I know in our family, I love teriyaki sauce and I love cheese sauce. Um, and I love enchilada sauce. I could have those in my refrigerator and be good to go for the week. Mm -hmm. And the soy curls and teriyaki sauce goes so well. So one of the things I like to do is rehydrate the, <clears throat> the curls. It takes like 10 minutes and then you know, charm up a little bit into more manageable eating pieces and put a little bit of the teriyaki sauce and then I air fry it. And that added to a stir fry is so delicious. Yeah. Okay. I'm so, like really stomach. Um, <laughs> add the water and take the water back out again. And yeah. now you have something that's special. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I love, yeah. The, I'll tell you the soy curls are game changers for so many people because it gives it that that meaty texture and it just absorbs any flavor and they're so easy but how they make them is they cook them and then they a little bit and they stretch them and then they um dehydrate them um yeah, that's basically I was you know I was looking for a video on ex exactly how they made those but they I read it somewhere on their uh I went to Butler's and I think I, I read it somewhere I was like how what is the process of it so that's really all they do is they cook stretch mm -hmm. and dehydrate so yeah. amazing. And there's some other meat replacers that I don't use because I consider them very processed, but there's a lot of people out there that like to use seitan or make their own seitan. Um, seitan is, it is, it's basically it's gluten. Mm -hmm. Take the gluten out of the flour and they, you know, need, you knead it and you bake it and it's very dense and chewy and much like meat. Um, but it doesn't really agree with me. So I don't, I don't yeah. do much seitan. Um, and it's, other, yeah, it's for gluten-free folks too. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. There's a lot of, excuse me, <laughs> a lot of processed um, meats out there. You know, there's Beyond Meat Sausage and then there's um, Morningstar has some, but I don't know how, I don't know how vegan they are, but they're, they're all out there. But I think you can create your own by using tofu and mm -hmm. bacon. And, you know, the closer we get to eating whole foods, and the whole plant, the healthier you'll be. So I, I tend to, we don't use oils. There's no oils in the cookbook because it's highly processed. Um, but I, I tend to stick with the whole foods. It's not to say that Nelson and I don't ever have vegan cheese now and then we we do and when we splurge, but I know when I'm eating it, but I'm eating mostly oil. Mm -hmm. So we try to encourage that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, this, this is great. So definitely guys, you've got to check out this book. Okay. I'm seriously going to be eating as soon as we're done. Um, <laughs> moving, I'm going to pull out your, what is your favorite recipe in this book, by the way? I'm curious. I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I, so it depends on the day that somebody asks me and it changes every podcast. I give a different answer. The one that I commonly say is that the lasagna stew, that's probably one of my favorite, but um, mm -hmm. I like the enchiladas with mole sauce. The mole sauce is so good. And I use peanut butter in it. It has a little bit of chocolate. It's just got a lot, a lot of flavor. But this particular book is, I think it's more unique than my others. First of all, I learned a lot when I was doing this, but mm. I incorporated a lot of desserts. Mm. Not, not a lot, but a, more desserts. And I think this book is um, very strong in the dessert department. We've got peanut butter and um cup bars and we've got a sweet potato pie chocolate pie we have to stop right there okay because this for you whatever when you first showed me this recipe I can't remember when it was that is ingenious recipe y'all don't understand like <laughs> we make it every holiday Thanksgiving and Christmas and if I don't Jonathan my middle one's like mom are you gonna make that sweet potato mousse pie I was like Kim, yes, I'm going to make it. <laughs> it's worth Kim. But it's just, I mean, it's unbelievable, delicious. Sorry, it, please keep going. <laughs> no, it really is. When I the, the way I developed it is I had a chocolate tofu pie in one of the cookbooks. And I thought, why, why can't we do this with sweet potatoes? Because they're already sweet. They have a great consistency. 
So I kind of did the same thing I did with the tofu pie. I used dates and I used sweet potatoes and just trying to think of what else I have some vanilla, but then it has chocolate chips in it. And it doesn't have a lot of chocolate chips. It has enough chocolate chips to hold that pie together. So when you refrigerate it, it really firms up kind of like a, I think like a cheesecake almost. It's amazing. Oh, it is so delicious. And I would say it would probably get better if it's more than a few days, but it never lasts more than a few days because it's literally gone. Okay, I'm going to show you guys a picture of it in here. Oh my goodness. I can't even tell you. And then I like to make like a compote with like either strawberries or something like that, where you just, oh my goodness. I will, I will say with this pie, I'm sure you have a Vitamix. Having a really good, strong blender is really important because yeah. the blending of that pie filling, it takes a little bit of work because um, you've got, you know, you've got to get your tamper down in there and really push those potatoes and those dates. But yeah. I don't believe I have any added sugar in that. That's the cool thing. It's all dates, cocoa powder, sweet potatoes, and a little bit of chocolate chips, but you could even use the Lily's chocolate chips, which mm -hmm. is made for PBS. So Yep. You feel, it feels like you're cheating, doesn't it? Feel like yeah. You're cheating? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It's so good. Yeah. There's a lot of great ones. And then there's a, I use sweet, I use a Japanese sweet potatoes for the lemon bar. Mm. I love sweet potatoes for dessert, using them for desserts. Um, and then we had the other one I have is grasshopper bars, Boston cream pie. That's our love story. Mm. That's an interesting story. Tell me about I your love story. Yeah. So when I first met Nelson, we were in high school and I was taking a gourmet cooking class. Um, I always thought I wanted to go to culinary school. And my father said, no, you're not going to culinary school. So I took all the courses that I could in high school. Um, bef I hadn't even hardly met him. He was in my chemistry class and I was making this Boston cream pie and I brought it back and I shared it with him. And he loved it so much. So that when we start after that, we started dating. So I kept making Boston cream pie. So my mother-in-law says, you know, every time you would come home with that Boston cream pie, I knew you were up to something. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's how I, I nabbed Nelson early on was the Boston cream pie. And that man loves to eat. So it was an easy one. He, I, I, I've never, I mean, he, he just, he loves to eat. Food is his oh. thing. Oh, that's, oh my gosh, that's fabulous. I'm going to remember next time I talked to him, I was like, I know about the Boston cream pie. <laughs> oh, well, he hooked a pretty good one in you too. So I'm going to say, um, but yeah, I, I love the, the dressing and the sauces. It's just fabulous. Um, as far as, I mean, I could, I literally, do you think, I do have a question. Do you think that your sweet potato, um, pie would make a good fudge sickle if we had like the little being put the stick would it freeze pretty good and be yes, kind of we actually did it during one of those cook-along shows we actually made we used the pudding pie we used that particular pie okay. and make pudding pops with it so there's two ways <laughs> excuse me we've had a little bit of a cold here but there's two ways you can do it you can do the avocado chocolate pudding which is in I think it's in this book or you can use the sweet potato chocolate pie. Both of them make fantastic fudgesicles. And then you'll have them and you can portion them so you don't eat too much. You just mm. have a little popsicle at night. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And we've got we've got a ninja creamy, Lori. I don't know if you know about that. No, what is that? Oh, we have a ninja <laughs> creamy. So you could use it in the ninja creamy and make chocolate ice cream. It's a it's a fantastic what? machine. Nin you, wait, ninja what? Ninja creamy, N-I-N-J-A, creamy, C-R-E-A-M-I. You can buy them on Amazon. Kathy Hester has a great, um, she's got a whole course on the ninja creamy. So in a nutshell, this is how you do it. It comes with these little pint containers and you fill the pint container with whatever you want. Um, I fill mine with canned pineapple a lot in the juice. I add a banana, just kind of mash it up. You don't have to blend it. And then you put the top on it, stick it in the freezer and get it gets rock solid. The next morning you take it, take the top off, put it in your Ninja Creamy and it has a blade that goes down in that pint and makes the best ice cream you've ever had. I know it's, it's genius. So, oh, so, a lot so much easier things. than the, the nano machine or whatever. So much easier, so much easier. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm going to have to do this for Patrick because my husband is an ice cream. I can't let he. I can't let him out of my sight because if he goes to a grocery store by himself, he comes back with vegan ice cream, and it's just. But this might be okay. Oh. So if you think about how much you spend on vegan ice cream, what are they like eight nine dollars for a pint? It's ridiculous. Yeah, it is. So the Ninja Creamy seems expensive out of the gate. I think it's like in the 170s or whatever, but it pays for itself very quickly. So within 10 days make, here, and you, yeah, you, can make, you can make it rich. You can use, I've used coconut milk before and cocoa powder and, or you, I tend to use bananas and dates and yeah, we mm. have some, now we're having chocolate ice cream for dessert tonight. Oh, and, yeah. Okay. Well, there goes my next Amazon purchase and yep. sweet potato pie. Maybe I'll make it extra because I've already made it twice this year. So, <laughs> or last year. Um, wow, that's good. I wow, like this. Listen, to this guys, this is what I'm talking about. Kim is a wealth of resources. So, get you've definitely got to get this cookbook. And let's talk also with, you know, you and Nelson and your beautiful relationship starting with banana cream pie. And then you have three kiddos. Well, they're adults now. And tell us, how was it raising children, eating this way? What's a good way to transition? What were the challenges? What do you think? Um, it's definitely challenging. I won't say it's easy, but it's um, that our kids don't really, they don't really know anything different because it's how, it's how we start feeding them. Probably we've got more serious with the second one. Um, we had our kids pretty young. So let's say the first one was born in 91. She's 31 now. Um, I would say she was plant-based most of the time, her first year of life, but then, you know, we were transitioning slowly. We, we, we thought we were doing things really a hundred percent, but we weren't a little bit of cheese here, a little ice cream cone there. And then when our second son came along, we got really serious because he had a lot of ear infections. He had asthma. He had all those things that, you know, I, I, I think it got better as we really cleaned up our diet. So um, when he was going to sleepovers and spending time with my parents, we were really careful about him not eating a lot of dairy products because it did, it affected his son, um, his hearing and his asthma and all of it. And he outgrew all of it, thank goodness. But um, that was when we got really serious. And, and I would say, when was it? Um, early 2000s. Nelson's mother got melanoma. You probably know that story, Lori. She got melanoma. It was in, he wrote about it in Hole. And our kids were at that point teenagers. And we just, when that happened, it just sort of blew blew us all away. So that's when we really got strict. She got, not to say they weren't already strict, but (laughs) the little things like, um, you know, the M&Ms at the store and just those little things that you don't really think about and eating a lot more greens and vegetables. She got stricter about it. We got stricter about it. So when that happened, I think it, 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 the whole family did a 360 Um, and she's doing great now. She's doing great. And when even, you know, she could have had that melanoma for years and years since she was a kid because it was a big mole on her leg and um, you know, it it, it happens, but it didn't, it didn't transpire into anything. Wow. Amazing. And it may have been, you know, even though she wasn't as strict in the beginning that it slowed that progression. So, and how old are the Campbells now? Um, Colin is 88 and Karen is 82 years young, I should say years young. And they're very mobile. They go places. They're, you know, full of life, very alert and aware. So it's great. It's great to see them go into their elderly years like this, I hope and pray that that will be me because as I watch my own mother and the, the, the health problems that she's had, that's, that's the, another reason to be plant-based. So you don't have to go through all this suffering. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. So do you know who Jack Lelaine was? Yes. So I met, I interviewed his wife, Elaine Lelaine, <laughs> and they call oh. her Lala. And she lives here in California. And then I met her in person in Florida, just at the ACLM conference in the fall. And she remembered me and she is sharp, 97. She's sharp as a whip. 
and she showed me pictures when we were talking. She gave a, she was a Jack Lillay, they give a posthumous, um, posthumous, excuse me, uh, for award for his lifelong <laughs> dedication to health and she accepted for him. And she showed, showed me pictures. She goes, yeah, I was working out this morning. So she's like, show me on her, her bed. She's doing like abdominal crunches and she's like 97. Her balance is a little bit off, you know, and she's, but boy, she's sharp as a whip. She had that audience rolling, like 2,000 people. Yeah, but you know, interviewed her on this yeah. show. Yeah. Okay, that's going to be my next listen tomorrow. <laughs> I'm walking, I want to listen to that. So the Lelanes were, um, they were plant-based. They were, so he was mostly vegetarian. I think there were some meat, but they were mostly predominantly plant-based. Yeah. And um, just a really fun story. So he was 12 years older than her. He died when I think he was 97, Had was swimming like, the morning he died or something like that day before. I mean, just some crazy, amazing life. And uh, she is just, I was, I need it. We're going to interview again, um, but uh, we haven't set that up. But she's, because she just put out another book at 97. Wow, that's amazing. (laughs) It's incredible. Yeah, so that that reminded, just made me think of some amazing people. Um, You know, Dr. Spock, Dr. Spock was vegan. Really? Oh, yes, actually, I think so. In his books, right? He talks about children going strictly plant-based uh, by age two. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. I do remember that though. They were so ahead of their times. Your, your in-laws, so, the Esselstyns, all these people. Yeah, so ahead of their times. That's oh, true. Amazing. There's a, a Dr. Esser, um, who's a friend of mine. He's a fourth generation plant-based physician. Well, I don't know if he were a physician, but fourth generation of plant-based, like his great, great grandfather or mm-hmm. great grandfather was plant-based. I mean, it's just so amazing to me to see these families. Um, amazing. Yeah. Ah, goodness. So amazing. Right. You raise your kids, you saw them get better. Um, of course, you know, a lot of people have heard, listen to this podcast have heard me talk about my story. So I won't go back to that, but it's so important because you're investing in their future health because they're going to and future generations right their kids are also going to be learning from their parents but you have other resources for us um right the plant pure communities the pods can you tell us a little bit about that and where people can find information so after we after nelson wrote plant pure nation the call to action at the end of the film was to you know start in your communities because that's how we're going to create changes through the grassroots movement. Um, so the call to action was to form pods. And we started up a nonprofit organization called Plant Pure Communities. And in Plant Pure Communities, we have a pod network. So we have pods all over the world. Um, and there's a map. If you go to that website, it was a map that shows you where the pods exist. If you are in, let's say you're in um uh Atlanta, Georgia, you can go to that pod map. You can find out what pods exist, you know, locally near you. You can join a pod. You can start a pod. If there is no pod, then start a pod. Because one of the things that we think is so important is, is being able to connect with a like-minded people. Uh, sometimes you feel a little isolated. You decide to go plant-based and you're out there and there's no one doing it. And, and that really is true. I, I know that when we go to church, uh, there's nobody in our church who's plant-based. And we go to Wednesday night suppers and it's lovely. I love the people there, but nobody's plant-based. So if if I if I were all by myself and I didn't have Nelson, I might feel a little isolated. So I think f- finding a pod and starting a pod is really important. Um, so all of those resources are plant peer communities. We also have projects for the pods to get involved in. There's a restaurant campaign. There's square foot, <coughs> excuse me, square foot, square foot gardening. Um, there's also a course that we are revamping right now. So it's not available on the website, but you can take it, take, take the course, um, <clears throat> kind of walks you through the whys because knowing your why is really, really important. You have to know your why. Because if people start asking you, why are you plant-based? Where did you get this information from? You have to be able to talk smartly. So read the China study, watch Forks Over Knives and Plant Pure Nation and Game Changers and all of them. Show them to your children because children, the way you're going to get these kids to, to be interested and open to it is by educating them. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that that's Plan Pure Communities is a nonprofit organization. So go to the website and check it out. There's lots of great stuff on it. 
Excellent. Absolutely. And also, you know, getting kind of back to the food element, you guys have food in supermarkets. So can you tell us what that is, what's coming out? Um, so we, we have find food it? in supermarkets, mostly on the East Coast. Uh, Publix is our biggest supermarket. We carry food in Lowe's and then there's a couple of very small supermarkets, but mostly Publix um, and Lowe's at this point. We have five I'm probably going to get it wrong, Lori. We have four or five frozen entrees right now. We also have uh, burritos that are coming in to the supermarkets. Uh, they're, they're kind of dripping in slowly. Some of the supermarkets carry different things. Uh, we're also talking to Wegmans. So if you're on the East Coast, you know who Wegmans is. That's We're hoping we get in there too. They loved our, our um, burritos. So that's oh. that's fun. That's awesome. That. When are you going to come to the West Coast? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so then that's just under the plant pure. Uh, plant pure foods. Plant pure foods. Plant cool. pure foods. In the frozen and section. We, and we've also been, we've had dry lines in the past, but we've, we're working on one right now um, that we hope will be available. We hope, um, we're not going to make any guarantees, but we hope it'll be available when the when the film food from food to freedom comes out um and it's really kind of you know you asked me about sauces mm -hmm. and so i had this idea that we should create sauces for people so they can build those sauces and put them in the refrigerator so i'll just give you a quick synopsis of the sauces so i have a cheese sauce i have an enchilada sauce um we have a coconut curry, we have a peanut sauce, we have a veggie burger, which is amazing. It's the best veggie burger I've ever had. Just add boiling water to it and it's amazing. Um, we have a cookie mix. And with a cookie mix, you can make brownies, and chocolate chip cookies and muffins. And so with these dry packs, you can build recipes from them. So like the enchilada pack, you can make a taco sauce, um, you can make burritos with um, the cheese. Um, the cheese pack has probably 15 recipes that are paired with it. So if you buy your packs, you'll also um, be able to get on the ebook, which contains all the recipes for it. So, so this cookbook is kind of, I, I was telling you this before we started the podcast, it's kind of what I was doing. Now I'm working on this dry line mm -hmm. and we use it all the time. I have boxes of it in my pantry and I think I use that more than I do my own spice cabinet. I just grab things and build with Can it. Can I buy a box from you? Yes, I'll give you a box. I want you to test them. Try test them. Them. Yes, and then maybe that'll be the next uh, when you're ready to launch. Let's talk I'm like we could talk about my experience in there and maybe, you know, I just, oh, this would be amazing to share that with patients. That resource would be incredible. That's, so. that's why we did it, Lori, because so many people, we know this when we did the immersion together, that people, when they, they walk away, they get really excited and they're passionate and then they get home and they struggle a little bit more and the days go on pretty soon. They're only doing it like once or twice a week. If they had these packs and they have the recipes. I mean, some of them literally take me five or 10 minutes to make. Mm. They have them. I really think we would create a lot more success. Mm. So that's the key is to, you know, people go plant-based, they get the results, they see it. How do they do it? And it's, it's a no brainer. Mm. I love that. And you're giving them the flavor, right? Cause I think that's where people struggle. They just kind of all right, I'm going to eat iceberg lettuce and carrots. And you're like, no, 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 there's so much more to this amazing plant world. So, oh, that's exciting. Oh, wow. Yummy. Well, you mentioned the immersion. So, and the film. Um, so I was so honored to be a part of. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So the immersion we did in Greensboro back in, what was the date? October 2020. 20, 2020? Was it 21. 2021. Yeah, I turned so, 51 while I was there. <laughs> it was really fun because I only know you through phone calls and this kind of thing. And you came to, I'm, I've, been, I've met you a couple of times in person, but when you came to, to the immersion, I felt like we were having a 10 day sleepover. It was really fun. We got to know each other. <laughs> we had so much fun. Oh my goodness, guys. I yeah. got <laughs> Oh. Watching you do your magic with these patients was amazing. So we took 10, you know, we took, I think eight. eight people in and six of those people had diabetes and we put, we're not going to tell the whole story because that's part of the film, but we put continuous glucose monitors on them 
do put continuous glucose monitors on them. And Fernando and I fed them for 10 days, which was such, so it was fun. So delicious. I wanted to take you both home with me so desperately. Mm. Yeah, it was just, it was so fun to watch them enjoy the food and watch you enjoy the food. I mean, we all became foodies together. Mm. A lot of fun. Mm. Um, I would love to do immersions all the time. If I could just give everything up and just do immersions the rest of my life, that would make me so happy. Mm. Maybe that Sign will me up. Happen. Sign me up. No, I just, I would think that'd be fabulous. I mean, I would love to take groups of doctors and put them through an immersion like this with you because oh, I think, oh yeah, I, I would call it heal the healers and we would, we would take sick doctors, heal them, with the power of food and lifestyle medicine, and that would be your next. And then they go out and treat patients. And I just feel like that would be such a wonderful, lovely thing. So, um, you know, we have a place in Hillsboro that we're looking at. Let me know. Let Talk me after know. the podcast. Let but, me know, yeah. girl. You let me know. Yeah. Um, and then, so where, when is the film coming out? Where can we find it? Um, what's those details? So the film comes out in February, this February, 2023, rough. I'm not sure when, I'm not sure if it's middle or end of February. Um, you can find out about the film at Plant Pure Communities. That's another reason to go on the website. Um, Nelson will probably um, send out, uh, you want to get on the mailing list, he'll probably send out emails to everybody and let them, letting them know. Um, food, food Revolution, they're also going to be sending it out to their people as well. So when right be, probably a couple of weeks before we go we go live, um, we will be sending out a lot of information. So, yeah, awesome. Well, this is excellent. I'm so excited. It was um, it was such a unique experience to have cameras following you around. <laughs> I know you're used to kind of having cameras around, but all you know doing your cooking shows and stuff. But I mean, you didn't. I didn't want to walk out the door without making sure I was fully dressed because I'm sure nobody wants to see this when it first wakes up. Oh. This. And so I was like, boy, it was good. It was really fun. Um, but just really to see the patients, you guys definitely watch it. It's just, um, they're such incredible humans that were there and just come spend 10 days with us, take, you know, hiatus of their life and mm -hmm. invest in their health and get to know, you know, Kim and everybody and Nelson and Fernando and the team. I think what was fun for me, and I was just reflecting on this because this is, I'm going to year 11 of being plant-based myself. And, you know, of course, Colin's book, The China Study was my first introduction into the plant-based world, right? And I, to be able to go from that in 2012 to now and, you know, have Dr. Campbell in the film and me be a part of it in your family, I can't even tell you. Yeah. It's the highlight of my life. This is lovely. This is absolutely wonderful. So I'm so thankful. So, um, you know, it's one of those things that you're, you're grateful for, and I'm definitely grateful for, and that's a highlight for sure. So, um, but you but, know, I learned a lot from you, Lori. I, I, I mean, just the, looking at the blood sugars mm. and, you know, you talking to me about food being in its whole form, mm new diabetics, the importance of that. So mm -hmm. I, I really learned a lot about flowers and, you know, anything that was a little bit more processed was difficult for them. And looking at those monitors, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. No, I tell you the CGM, even if you're not a diabetic, it's, it's a wonderful tool just to put on yourself for a month or so, just because it's, it's, I've worn them multiple times. It's just so much you can learn. Um, and you can test it out, right? So like, for example, I tell my patients, I'd eat rolled oats. I've eaten rolled oats for a hundred years. <laughs> it's like, I can't remember. And the steel cut oats, when I saw the rolled oats, my blood sugar would bump to like 160. I was like, whoa, because everything else, it was like 120s, might be 130 if I eat something a little heavier. And, but I was like, what is going on? But then I moved to steel cut oats and it was like flatline 110. And I was like, wow. And it's just all it is, is flattening it out just a little bit. It's not even a flower. And it really made me start thinking, you know, when I'm speaking to patients and where they are in their diabetic recovery, um, as far as, you know, remission or improvement that in that very beginning phase is they're becoming more insulin sensitive. Um, we need to be focused in a more of the more lower glycemic foods, which is more of the whole foods, right? There were steel cut oats versus the rolled oats, you know, you can still have your rolled oats, but 
um, just, it's just something to be mindful of. It's just, it was really good for me to do that. Mm -hmm. so, um, well, you know, I've always struggled with, with weight when I, even when I was in high school, you know, carrying a little extra 10 pounds here or there, you know, kind of the roller coaster thing. And I, and I know for myself, eating those processed flours, like bread, a lot of mm -hmm. bread and cookies and things like that will, will pack the weight on really mm -hmm. fast. Mm, um, absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. and yeah and you know and you know speaking as as middle-aged women um yeah you hit menopause and things change they're like oh menopause doesn't affect the weight I'm like hogwash yes, it does. <laughs> the eating mm -hmm. has not changed but things are different and yeah. um <laughs> So yeah. I was like, I think men did wrote those articles, um, but you know, I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, there are some definitely some things that for women and especially in this group that are really important is that you know the resistance training and building that muscle and making more resistance and focusing in on where do we need to dial in the diet just a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I agree. Um, the flowers and they add those calories add up so quickly. Um, mm -hmm. There's so much things to, to just be conscious of in our own life, even if we're whole food plant based and um helping others. But it's been a journey for all of us. Um and that's kind of where we're excited at Mora is we bring in that community piece too because we're doing group visits. Um yeah. and it's uh it's really nice to see the dynamic and as we're you know ramping up our groups and across the country and seeing results and people stopping meds and it's like ah it's so fun. But yeah, it's very exciting. It, it really is. is. It is a lot of fun. Yeah. Cool. Well, is there anything else that you feel like you'd like to share? Um, because this would be a wonderful book for starters, beginners, those who aren't, who are maybe feeling tired and need some inspiration in the kitchen. This is a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, okay. and again, thank you also for letting me put a little um blurb in here to encourage that was so much fun. Um it's my first book. I, I got to be able to um, give a little blurb to support. So um, yeah, what what else should we let people so know? There's, there's one thing about this book that I think makes it stand out a little bit is um, it tastes really good. And, I, you know, there's so many people as, as they go, mm -hmm. days, they think they have to give up a lot of things. They think they have to give up salt. They have to give up, you know, a little bit of sugar and they have to give up oil, you should give up oil because you can get oil in other places. Mm -hmm. um, they have to give up gluten. Although this rest, this cookbook is mostly gluten-free. It's not all gluten-free. Mm -hmm. I think that people get really inundated and overwhelmed with all of the parameters around being, a, being vegan or being plant-based. And I don't know anybody that, I, I don't know any research out there that says our food shouldn't taste good. And my father-in-law always talks about that. You know, he's not SOS free himself. And he always says, you know, there's no research that we shouldn't season our food a little bit or mm. a little bit of maple syrup to our, our oatmeal to give it a little bit of flavor. So that's my philosophy about food. And I think if we don't make it taste good and we don't make it look good because we eat with our eyes, um, we're never going to change the world. So mm. I think all of my books, I think, are good for that reason. So I'll I'll never be SOS free. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and that's okay. Flavor that's is so important. important. Yeah, flavor is very important. And um, and I will, <laughs> will be the first in line to say your food is delicious. I came, <laughs> I came back from that immersion I'm like, Pat, I have to cook again. And I'm sorry you're gonna miss out on Kim's cooking. I'm I yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I bet you're a great cook, Lori. I oh. know. Yeah, but I, I tend to like hone in on just a few recipes where you get, you experiment. And I'm just looking here, like at the possibilities, like it's mm -hmm. just, and it all meets the parameters of a doctor approved book. Like, this is fantastic. I can't tell you guys, you got to go out and get it right now. Like this I, right I, after you listen. I do think you were one of my endorsements. Yeah, you just- I am. That's so why I was like, I got one of the endorsements. I was so excited. I said, this is a wonderful addition. To anyone wanting not only healthy, whole food, plant-based recipes, but delicious at the same time, these are doctor approved. Mm -hmm. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> you give that book to your patients. So. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's a wonderful resource. I'll definitely make sure and put that. We have a resource list and we'll make sure we'll put this on here for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But- 
thank you, Kim, again for one, just being the person you are and a dedication of life to people and helping it better and your family. And I know it's tough at times and, um, but we just, it's just so wonderful what you guys do. So thank you. And you, you too. Ditto. Oh. <laughs> what you do. All right, guys, so go check it out at plantpurecommunities.org. Uh, get on the mailing list, wait for the movie, share the movie, share the pods, go make a pie, get this book. So you guys got your walking orders. That's fantastic. Marching orders, I should say. Um, <laughs> thanks again, Kim. Thanks, Lori. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go, though, please hit the subscribe and alert buttons so you don't miss out on any of the amazing content we're working so hard to provide you. We upload a new episode of Health & Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus every Friday. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find us on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. If you're looking for amazing resources to help you start and sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, or anything wellness, we got you covered there too. Because at Mora, we actually provide physician-led support groups to help people live happier, healthier lives free of metabolic disease. Don't forget to check out our website at mora.com. And thanks again for watching.